Okay, good evening and welcome to Yes, You Can Perform a Fear-Free Canine Orthopedic Exam with Dr. Kristen Kirkby Shaw. I'm Christy Keith, Senior Communication Strategist for Fear-Free. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items and I will repeat this at the end and I'll also put it in the chat a couple of times because people ask these things quite a bit. Um, first, though, we'd like to thank our friends and Fear Free sponsors at Zoetis Pet Care for making this webinar possible. We'd also like to thank all of you for making time for this webinar this evening. We know how busy you are and how hard it can be sometimes to commit an hour to your continuing education, but we're really proud to be able to provide that to you this evening. Speaking of continuing education, yes, Race CE is available for this live webinar and we'll be sending your CE certificates to you tomorrow, Friday. If you don't hear from us by the end of the day on Friday, please email the office at wags at fearfreepets.com so they can assist you. Don't email the email that sent you the invite because we will not be able to assist you. That's just the webinar team. You need to get someone in the office to help you uh, with CE. Um, and also, obviously, by the end of the day on Friday, they won't get back to you until after the weekend, but you will get an autoresponder so you know that they have your email in their queue. Uh, the recorded version of this webinar will be available soon at fearfreepets.com slash webinars. Uh, Dr. Shaw will be taking questions. She'll be answering them at the end. Um, please ask your questions as soon as they arise for you during the presentation rather than saving them up until the end. It really helps us with the flow uh, of questions and lets us pick the best ones. Um, please post your questions not in the chat but in the Q&A window. And now that all that housekeeping is done, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter. Dr. Kristen Kirkby Shaw is an accomplished and highly skilled double board certified veterinary surgeon who has done extensive research in soft tissue surgery and rehabilitation. She has published numerous journal articles and textbook chapters, received several awards, and has spoken at national and international conferences. She received her DVM from the University of Florida in 2003 and also did a four-year small animal surgical residency there, becoming a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Surgeons in 2008. In 2010, she moved to Seattle and began working in private practice. She became board certified in veterinary sports medicine and rehabilitation in 2013. And of course, she is a fear-free certified professional. Thank you so much for giving your, your time to us this evening, Dr. Shaw. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Christy. And I just wanna echo what you said. Thank you to everyone out there for taking the time to join us tonight. I know how hard it is to rally at the end of the day, at the end of a long week. So I hope that you're sitting down with uh, a nice beverage that might help uh, decrease any stress or anxiety that you may have had in, uh, in the clinic today. So I know when I attend presentations, I, I kind of categorize a talk into generally one of two buckets. And the first one is what I call confidence booster. And that's when I go to a presentation and the speaker is talking about something that I already do in practice, but it makes me think, well, cool, I'm glad I'm not alone in this and, and I'm doing it the right way. Or good, I'm glad I had the right dose uh, of, of a medication. The next category is one that is, I, I would consider kind of pearls and nuggets. And this is where you walk away from the presentation with immediately tips or tricks or tools that you can use in practice. Obviously there's gonna be some presentations that don't fit into either category. But before, you know, before we get into the, the real details of this presentation, I want to share a quick story with you about how I ended up where I am in my career. And it, you know, so it started when I was a senior in vet school. I knew I wanted to specialize in something, but I hadn't quite committed to surgery. Um, but then I had my orthopedic surgery rotation and I fell in love. I absolutely loved orthopedic surgery. And then someone on that orthopedic rotation said that women weren't any good at orthopedic surgery. So that was just the, the kind of nail in the coffin last straw that I needed to fully commit myself to becoming an orthopedic surgeon. 
So I was very lucky to land a great residency with a very strong ortho focus. Um, and one of my jobs as a surgical resident was to teach the vet students the orthopedic exam. So every other week, my dog Bailey, who is pictured here, would come to work with me and he would teach the students how to do their orthopedic exam. And he is an absolute, or he was an absolute angel. This picture here um, was actually staged to demonstrate me doing passive range of motion. That's why he's on the floor and I'm on the floor. But when we would do the orthopedic exam, we would plot Bailey up on a table. He would lay there just like this and let the students palpate. Now, looking back, uh, I think he was probably doing an awful lot of lip licking and yawning that I didn't notice or I didn't think much of at the time. So one day, uh, I'm a first year resident and I have a case that I've got to do my own orthopedic exam on for a dog that comes in with a thoracic limb lameness. We bring the dog to the back to the treatment area, plop the dog on the table in the middle of the treatment room. Dog's restrained by a technician and one of the students. And I go through my very thorough, very systematic orthopedic exam. And at the end, I have not made the dog cry out. The dog has not pulled back and I have no idea what's wrong with the dog. So I ask my attending clinician um, for a second opinion. He goes through and does his orthopedic exam and lo and behold, the dog yelps. And so the lesson that I was taught that day was that I wasn't pushing hard enough. So this particular dog uh, didn't need orthopedic surgery. So we sent him home with recommendations for rest and remedial. And this case just left me feeling all kinds of wrong. And it was actually one of the catalysts for me pursuing rehab because I knew that I want to be able to offer something more than orthopedic surgery. So over the last 15 years or so, my orthopedic exam has evolved tremendously and it looks nothing like what I was trained to do or what I used to teach students to do. And a lot of it came from pearls and nuggets that I picked up from a human physical therapist and other rehab vets um, in my training and, and along the way. And then it was last year when I was actually going through fear-free certification. And <clears throat> at the end of the course, I felt so validated and I felt like my confidence was boosted because it turned out that the orthopedic exam I had evolved into doing was actually on the right track. So my hope, my goal for you guys tonight is that your confidence is boosted and that you leave here with some pearls and nuggets and tips and tricks to get you, um, you know, again, feeling more confident in your orthopedic exam as early as tomorrow. So we're gonna go through a brief overview of kind of what the orthopedic exam is and why. Um, touch on some of the fear-free principles. I know many of you guys out there are fear-free certified. If you're not, I highly recommend it. Um, but we'll talk about the ones that I think are most important as they apply to the ortho exam. And then, I'll talk you through what I have developed into my, my version of the orthopedic exam, which I do think is, is you know, pretty, pretty close to fear-free. All right, so who needs an orthopedic exam? Really, obviously, you know, if a dog presents to you for a mobility concern, for a lameness, for limping, you're gonna wanna do an orthopedic exam. But we know that there's a lot of dogs that have, may have underlying orthopedic disease and they don't present with an obvious lameness. So you may want to incorporate an orthopedic screening exam. And I'm gonna show that to you later on. You'll wanna incorporate that into um, you know, a variety of cases, especially dogs that are at risk for orthopedic disease such as OA. So those that are overweight or obese, if they have any history of joint surgery or joint injury, our canine working dogs or athletes, and then certain breeds that are at risk. So your Labradors, your German Shepherds, Golden Retrievers. Um, I do wanna say that most of this presentation, I'm going to say dogs and we're gonna focus on dogs, but many of the things that, the, or the, many of the principles, will, you know, we can apply to cats, but the majority of this presentation is kind of tailored towards the canine exam. So as I mentioned, a fear-free ortho exam is not what you learned in vet school, especially if I was the one teaching it to you. Um, we've moved beyond that. So we're doing things a little bit differently now. And the goal is not to make the dog painful. Actually, what we're trying to do is find the most subtle signs of discomfort, but not causing pain. Um, we're looking for compensation and movement and avoidance of certain activities that 
may indicate that the dog is uncomfortable, but we aren't trying to purposely cause that pain. In my opinion, and in, in my experience, you can observe or you can learn so much from observation, um, almost more than you can from the actual palpation part. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that as we get into this. Absolutely avoid stainless steel tables. If the exam has to be done on a table, cover it with a yoga mat, cover it with blankets. Don't do like we used to do, just plop them and, and restrain a dog on a stainless steel table. The last thing I would point out um, is I strongly recommend against using uh, your white lab coat. So dogs do get afraid of that. Um, and so I, I don't wear a white lab coat at all for any sort of exam anymore. Um, I generally have a fleece on that has treats in the pocket. So um, I would definitely avoid using anything that's gonna tip the dog off that you're a doctor, unfortunately. All right, so when we talk about a comprehensive orthopedic exam, this is like your thorough, gotta figure out what's wrong. This is not going to be part of an annual visit. This is not something that I recommend working into a 15 minute exam. Um, you're just not gonna get as much out of it as, as you really could if you plan ahead. What I do recommend is incorporating what I call a one minute orthopedic screening exam. And that can be incorporated into any type of, of physical exam. When I see a patient for a soft tissue condition, if I'm seeing them for a mast cell tumor or something um, unrelated to orthopedics, I will still always incorporate this one minute screening in. Um, then when it comes time to really needing to dive deeper into this thorough orthopedic exam, you can do it, what I call it orthopedic workup. And many times this is actually a drop off appointment. But even if it's a full-fledged, just in and out appointment, you want to plan ahead for this. You want to plan plenty of time, plenty of resources, and planning ahead from a pharmaceutical standpoint. So for me, I if a dog is already on pain medications that NSAIDs, something that is you know being purposely prescribed to treat and manage pain, I much prefer that that they are given that medication that morning or the evening before they come in because I don't want them to be in a lot of pain because that, I, I think there's this misconception that you need them to be in pain to show the lameness. And my, my hope is that you can pick up on things that are more subtle than that. If they have unmanaged pain, their fear, anxiety, and stress is gonna be so much higher. So my opinion, give the pain meds. Use Trazodone. So it's gonna be an incredibly rare dog that wouldn't benefit from pre-exam trazodone for a full orthopedic exam. It just makes it easier for everyone. Um, then ideally no food. And so I know this kind of contradicts give NSAIDs, but don't get food. Um, it's gonna depend on what which NSAID you're using and what kind of time frame there, whether it's once a day or, or BID dosing. But the, the point of no food is that if they come in and they're hungry, they're going to like you and your treats more and you're going to be able to build that bond with them initially and get them to do things for you. Obviously, there are certain dogs that you can feed them breakfast and they're still gonna be hungry. But the other thing is, if you're planning ahead, you may have them drop off for this orthopedic um, workup that may include further diagnostics and you may want to sedate them further. So I like them to come in with a fairly empty stomach that allows me to give treats as needed and then sedate, it, um, sedate further for diagnostics if needed. So why would you bother an ortho exam if you're not a surgeon? You know, I think hopefully if you're interested in the topic and you're here listening to this tonight or, or on a recorded version, it means that you kind of you, you get the answer to this question. But really the reality is that most, if well, many, if not most of the causes of lameness don't actually need a surgeon or don't need surgery. The most common causes are gonna be related to OA. Um, but if you do need to refer, then it is helpful for the client and, and the um, whoever you're referring to to have an idea of what may be going on. And obviously doing an orthopedic exam is gonna help guide your diagnostic imaging. So these fear-free principles, um, again, this is you know just a couple slides to go into this. Uh, I think if you want all of the details of, of fear-free principles. Your, your audio is coming and going a little bit. Are you um, moving? closer and further from your microphone or? I will do my best to not do that. Okay. Can you hear me okay? 
<laughs> sounds really great now, but sometimes I think maybe you're leaning back and it okay. becomes a little hard to hear you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about Sorry. that. No problem. Thank you. All right. So fear free principles, again, this is we want to get off on the right foot with the dogs. Um, and that starts by creating the, the best environment for them. So we want a clean exam room, clean meaning uh, free from odors as well as visible hair and, and soiling rugs. So, oh my gosh, if there's one thing that you can do to change your practice in your exam room is to put down rugs wherever the dogs are going to be walking. You've probably seen those dogs that get terrified of, of slick floors. So please put down rugs um, anywhere you expect a dog to walk. Um, toys, beds, staff, lavender, all sorts of things that you could do in the exam room to make it a more comforting environment for them. Obviously use a calm voice. Uh, this is something I still have to work on myself, not using that high-pitched voice. Dogs actually get more, um, more anxious if we're talking really high versus just a, a nice, calm, low voice. And then the one that I think a lot of people have a hard time letting go of is doing a TPR first. So if your technician goes in and does a TPR, and then you come in and expect to do an orthopedic exam around their back end, it's going to be so much harder. So I find that even when I pull out my stethoscope, I still do TBRs, but I don't do them until the very end. If I pull out my stethoscope, the dog correlates that with the temperature, with the th thermometer, and, and I've kind of lost trust right there. So don't start the whole exam with a TPR. And then pre-exam pharma, I am a huge proponent, proponent of this. Working in a referral practice, I'm fortunate that we can flip through medical records and have an idea of whether this dog has a history of fear, anxiety, or stress, and my technicians can call ahead of time um, and talk to that client and make sure that they have trazodone at home, they have GABA at home, to make sure that they're giving it before they come in. Um, and I have, in some cases, if there's not, um, a, not, a, not a referring vet that is in the picture to to be able to prescribe that and, and we we know that the dog's going to be anxious i've had clients that actually call ahead and they're worried about the the stress of, of coming in um i'll do a, a telehealth a, a virtual kind of meet the client meet the the pet virtually and i think this day and age it's much easier and more accepted to do this and establish this this client patient relationship and then be able to prescribe a medication before they come in so I'm um, not going to get into any more details than that other than use the pharma, um, especially if dogs have a history of, of stress and anxiety. All right, then lots and lots and lots of positive reinforcement. These are some of my favorite um, treats that, that we'll use in the, um, in the exam. And then last but certainly not least is looking for signs of stress and understanding what this, this patient's baseline is. So if they're already stressed and they're already showing some of these lip licking, yawning, things like that, these are signs that also can be mistaken for pain. And so we need to know what we're starting with in order to know what early signs of pain may be versus, versus uh, just stress. And so this is, uh, this is actually Bailey, um, you know, demonstrating, this is, this is actually the, the one minute orthopedic screen um, that I'll show you a little bit more detail of later. But, you know, at the time of me taking this video, I honestly didn't appreciate that he hated it. Um, he was being a perfect angel, but as you can see, he's pretty stressed out. Um, he's not even laying down on a stainless steel, steel table. I'm the one doing the palpation and you can see he's already stressed. So, and that those were, I don't think, signs of pain. So when I went through the fear-free training, I think this was a concept that really made me feel the most confident and the most validated that I was okay in what I was doing. Because it's the principle of wants versus needs. We, of course, want to do a very thorough, we want to do a very systematic orthopedic exam. Yeah, it's best, certainly it's best for my body and it's, um, and it's easiest if the dog is on a, on a table in lateral recumbency being restrained, that is all ideal. But the reality is it's uncommon that we get all of that. Um, what we actually need is trust 
from the patient. We need them to be relaxed. And then we need to just narrow down the problem in order for us to get to the next step. Sometimes we're able to do all of the things. Sometimes the dog just wants to lay on the floor and they will let us do a completely thorough and systematic exam. Sometimes the dog is happy standing and allows us to do a completely thorough and systematic exam. Sometimes on the other end of the spectrum, we literally don't get to touch the patient the first time we see them. And we just start by establishing that, that trust and establishing just somewhat of a rapport to build on for future visits. And I'll explain this to clients. Um, and I think as we have these conversations, I've never had somebody push back and say, oh, actually I want you to, to make my dog stressed or anxious. I'll say, you know what? This is all we're gonna do today. I'm just gonna watch your dog. I'm gonna give your dog treats and we're gonna have to schedule a next, another appointment. Um, and you know, then probably sending home some pharmaceuticals. So again, balancing these wants versus needs. Um, please, 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 don't feel bad about not doing a thorough systematic exam. Um, if you're if you're if you're doing all of these other things right, um, it's okay. And this is the thing that made me feel so much better is it's okay if you don't do absolutely everything the first time. All right, so how do we do the tear free orthopedic exam? So in my opinion, 80% is observation, 20% is palpation. So when I was a vet student, again, um, I remember starting an equine rotation. It was actually equine surgery. And I'm not a horse person. I didn't grow up with horses. And the, the first day, the orthopedic surgery resident on equine said, um, I want each, each one of you students to name 10 things wrong with this horse just by looking at it. I couldn't even tell you what color the horse was beyond just brown. And it like to me, just being able to look at a horse and know it was wrong there was nothing I could do um, at the beginning of the rotation, I would say. But this example, I think is you now when I think about that with a dog, um, yeah, I could easily just look at a dog without putting my hands on and, and tell you 10 things about it. Um, and so I think just honing in on the, our observation skills and then putting our hands on the patient, this is to me kind of the essence of what makes it fear free. So we'll go through all of these. Again, home videos um, fall into the observation part. We'll talk more about that. So this is my one minute orthopedic screen. So it starts with observing movement and posture and transitions. We'll, I'm gonna show you examples of all of those. And then moving into um, paraspinal palpation. So yes, that is a palpation skill, but what you're doing is you're looking for a change in, in the paraspinal muscles. We're going to do a three leg stand. And so, yes, that's putting your hands on it, but you're observing for how, how much um, weight the, the dog's putting through your hand. And I'm gonna, I'll talk through a little bit more detail coming up. Um, joint swelling and then muscle atrophy. These are the kind of only things that are really true palpation that you need to deeply feel. And all of this is done with the dog standing. So you don't have to do any of this in lateral recumbency. In fact, none of it should be done in lateral recumbency. So it makes it very, very easy to incorporate into any sort of exam. All right, so starting with movement, ideally you would be able to watch the dog move from a down position where they are relaxed with their person in the, um, in the waiting room and watch them move into your exam room. Even pre-COVID, most of the time that didn't happen, right? So most of the time your technician would have brought the dog into the exam room, dog's already in the exam room and you come in. Um, nowadays with COVID, um, the dog's in the hospital without their, without their person and they're already more anxious. Um, I, some of you guys out there may not be doing curbside anymore. And, and so it's, everything has it's changed, right? But the point being, if you can watch the dog move from a comfortable, relaxed position to a stand position and into the exam room, you can see literally how did they stand? How did they move around? The other part of the movement component is asking clients to provide home videos. Now, if you ask clients to start showing you videos, you're gonna definitely blow that one minute um, pretty quickly uh, looking at home videos. But when we get into the more comprehensive exam, looking at home videos, how the animal moves around their home environment 
can be incredibly, incredibly um, helpful. The next one is posture. And each one of these dogs is, you know, you can, you can learn a lot just by looking at that posture. So the dog in the upper left, so the shepherd mix, you can tell that there's obviously some pelvic limb weakness. There's probably some neurologic component to this. Um, she's also really tucked up in her shoulders. That's a compensation from, from having that pelvic limb lameness um, or pelvic limb weakness. The golden retriever in the middle was a 12-year-old golden retriever that presented with an acute onset of this right thoracic limb lameness. So you can obviously see that the dog is standing non-weight bearing. And it was sent to me with a diagnosis of elbow dysplasia, elbow arthritis. Um, it's pretty uncommon for a dog with a long history of elbow arthritis to have an acute non-weight bearing lameness, especially in a 12-year-old golden retriever. So seeing just this sort of posture makes to make your hackles go up and a, a dog of this signalment, this dog had a, a nerve root tumor. Dog in the upper right-hand corner, just looking at the tarsus from the cranial aspect, you can see that thickening on the medial aspect of the tarsus. So that's a diagnosis that, you know, you can with a lot of certainty make from across the room. This is a one-year-old um, Labrador. Um, and that's gonna be OCD of the tarsus. The Frenchie presented for a uh, suspected cruciate rupture, but you can watch the, the Frenchie stand and has a, a, a CP deficit. So that turns out to be more of a neurologic condition. And then finally, the black lab in the bottom right corner, that's our classic stance for a cruciate tear. So all these things that you can not necessarily come up with a diagnosis, but these, these things that you can learn just by looking at the dog's posture. Then we want to observe how they sit. And ideally, we're going to watch how they sit on their own, not as a command of us asking them to sit. So the Rottweiler on the left, this is about an 11-month-old or so Rottweiler that presented with concern for thoracic limb lameness. Didn't show much of a lameness on um, gait evaluation, but when she sat, she would kind of do this external rotation of her left thoracic limb. And we do see that frequently with dogs that have medial cordonoid disease or medial compartment disease. They will sometimes look like they actually have an external rotation or an angular limb deformity, but it turns out to be just they're offloading that elbow and putting it in a position that's more comfortable for them. The Frenchie in the middle is actually my, my French bulldog, Beans. She's 14 and she has some significant neurologic deficits, and uh, she obviously does not sit properly. Um, so that's not normal. And then the black lab on the right is also my dog, and that's not a normal sit either, but he's just fine. He uh, taught me that there is something, there is such thing as uh, a sloppy sitter. So I used to have clients that when I'd ask if their dog was sitting normally, um, if that was normal for how they sat, if they were kind of kick their leg off to the side, they say, oh, they're just, they've always been a sloppy sitter. And I honestly didn't believe in sloppy sitters until I had one of my own. So um, just kind of noting that position. So with transitions, this is now, we've watched how the dog sits, but we want to see how they move from that sit to stand or from a stand to sit. And this picture here, this is our classic positive sit test or what some clients would describe as a sloppy sit. And this is I wouldn't go so far as to say pathognomonic, but it is highly suggestive of a cruciate injury um, because when dogs fully flex that stifle, the effusion, the joint effusion that's typically present with a cruciate rupture, that joint effusion is pushed into the joint capsule just by nature of flexing, fully flexing. By pushing into the joint capsule, the joint capsule is where the nerve endings are. So it distends the joint capsule and it's painful for them. So they assume this posture of a neutral position of their stifle because it's more comfortable for them. Then when they go from a seated to a standing position, they tend to just use that one leg to the, the down leg. In this case, it would be the right pelvic limb to stand and they don't use that um, the injured leg to, to thrust or push from a, a sitting, sitting position. Then we can also look at from a, a, a down to a stand or stand to a down. 
And I'm gonna show you this golden retriever and I want you to pay particular attention to his right front leg. This is a dog that has mild elbow dysplasia. So I don't mean to trick you because it's mild, but um, when he goes to push off from a down to a stand, he doesn't tend to put as much weight on that right front leg when he pushes off. So we can watch this a, a couple of times. One thing, so he doesn't shuffle down, which is much more common with older dogs, but when he goes to push off, he pushes primarily through that left front leg. Let me show it one more time. So it is, again, that's a, that's a pretty subtle one, but if you start watching and you start looking for things like this and incorporating these, these transitions into your physical exam, I promise you, you'll start picking up on, on things and say, so this is, again, it's not going to be pachymonic for elbow, but it's um, highly suggestive because if the dog is uncomfortable in their elbow or their shoulder, um, they may want to offload and push off more with the opposite leg. All right, and then now it's finally time to put your hands on the dog. So this is again the end of our one minute screening exam. The next part is the paraspinal palpation. That's where you take kind of your, your thumbs and palpate uh, just along the apaxial muscles, not necessarily on the dorsal spinous processes, but just to, the, just to the lateral aspect along the paraspinal muscles. And what you're looking for are muscle spasms. And these muscle spasms are not the same as um, you know, your, your cutaneous trunk eye, you're going a little bit deeper than that. And so what I find is that dogs that have pelvic limb issues, any of them, um, any reason to hurt in the back end and to offload towards the front, they will start having some discomfort and pain um, and compensatory issues in their paraspinal muscles. And you'll see that as, as, as kind of trigger points or spasms. The other time that this can happen though is um, dogs that have shoulder injuries may be also compensating their latissimus dorsi runs all along that paraspinal pathway too. And so there may be some tension there. The three leg stand, um, actually I should, I should preface this by saying that um, I have a video that goes through how to do this one minute screen. And actually Christy, if you don't mind throwing that um, URL up in, in the chat, this is something that is housed on the free fear free website and you guys can go take a look at on your own time. So I'm not going to take the time to show you a video of me doing an exam, but it is a resource for you to use after this and it will go through each one of these in detail. But so the three leg stand. This is with the dog standing. You're going to pick up one leg at a time and what you're looking for is the willingness for them to pick up that leg. So, for example, I had a golden retriever come in that had an FHO done a few years earlier and on the left side. Um, so left FHO, I go to pick up the left pelvic limb, no problem at all. Dog's happy for me to pick up the left pelvic limb. And by pick up, I mean dog's standing on all fours and I just pick up that right, that back left leg, no problem at all. Then I go to pick up the back right leg that does not want to give me that leg and does not want to bear weight on the left pelvic limb because he's weaker there. So that's a, just a, a, a cursory way to, to figure out the strength and which leg the dog's more willing to, to stand on. Next is joint effusion or swelling in the joint. You're going to, much, it's gonna be much easier to feel joint swelling with the dog standing actually. So that, that gravity um, and that the force of their body is gonna be more likely to allow the, you know, the joint fluid to push out into the joint capsule and for you to feel that. And it's really nice to be able to compare one side to the other. You're not gonna feel joint swelling or joint effusion in the shoulder or the hip. Um, you may or may not feel it in the elbow. If you are, you're gonna feel it on the lateral aspect, just underneath the ankyneus muscle. Um, the carpus, you'll feel it usually on the dorsal aspect. Stifle, that's the big, big joint that we're often feeling for, for effusion for. So always, you know, just get in the habit of feeling for that on the stifle. And then the tarsus, you may also feel some, some joint swelling or that firm periarticular swelling. And then the last part, um, again, this is still screening, but you're looking for muscle symmetry or muscle atrophy and running your hands along you know, the spine, along both sides of the shoulder, 
both sides of the hip and the gluteals and down the, the hamstrings and just looking for any asymmetry. So it's actually been shown that subjective palpation of the, the thigh muscles. So just with your hands, if you subjectively think that one side is more atrophied compared to the other, this has actually been shown to be fairly sensitive to, to say there's something wrong in the stifle. It's not specific, but it's pretty sensitive to saying that there's some stifle injury going on. So then this is the, um, the link to that one minute screening exam. Uh, so check that out um, when you get the chance. And then moving on to the comprehensive orthopedic exam. So this is again, the one that you want to schedule plenty of time for. Um, I admit I, I've been spoiled in, in my position um, I have an hour and a half for an initial examination, which I know most people don't. But if you're doing an, a true thorough comprehensive orthopedic exam, the best thing you can do is have the patient drop off for the day, have those pre-meds on board, and then be ready to move into any diagnostic imaging if you find a reason to do so. Um, use drugs. I mean, that's a, a pretty big tenet of, of fear-free. So. Um, yeah, use the drugs appropriately. And this, this comprehensive exam is going to build upon what we just talked about with the screening exam. Starting with the gait evaluation. And I think the gait analysis is often where, uh, you know, at least when I was teaching students, this is kind of where I lose them and, and people are like, oh, you know, gait evaluation. Um, yeah, a gait evaluation is, is important for a comprehensive and thorough orthopedic exam. Um, but there's right way to do it and there's definitely wrong ways to do it. So, um, and, and by wrong ways, it means it's going to be counterproductive, um, if, if not pointless. No slick floors. You want to do the gait evaluation ideally outside with no distractions. That's kind of like, yeah, right, that doesn't really exist. So if that doesn't work, then inside on rugs, just not slick floors. You want to avoid distractions, so any smells, any sounds, owners, anything that's going to kind of tip the dog off to not just walk per perfectly straight. And then but the next thing is just walking perfectly straight. So most dogs are not going to just walk perfectly straight on a loose lead. They're going to have some sort of shoulder harness on or a halter. They're going to be pulling. So that's really, really tough. In a perfect scenario, you'd actually watch the dog walk around without a leash in an enclosed area. So if you have that as an option, that's great. And for me, um, so I live in Seattle. So a lot of times during the winter, the weather is not super cooperative to go outside and do a gait evaluation. So we'll wind up either doing it in a hallway or honestly, I'll just watch them walk around the exam room. But now we're talking about specifically your gait evaluation. This is what I mean by not helpful. So slick floors, dog knows where the, do where the door is that he came in. Um, so he's going to pull for it, completely distracted, pulling. There's nothing that you can glean from this gait evaluation. So don't, don't even bother with that. So some tips to help make it more successful. When you're watching, you wanna watch from the back and from the side. Ideally, you're watching the dog walk and trot plus or minus run. Usually you don't need to get to that. Um, usually just kind of the walk and trot. Watch those transitions between like a walk and a trot pretty closely because sometimes that's where you'll catch like the, the hop or the skip or something that's a little bit off. Sometimes it's helpful to do stairs or circles um, this is the part, but just don't get super hung up on, you know, having to do stairs and circles. I don't have stairs in my, my practice, so we don't do those. Um, what I would say is this is, if you're, if you're finding you're needing to get to these sorts of things, ask the client to provide home videos because you're going to get so much more information from that, especially if you can use slow motion home videos. All right, so when, we, when we're trying to evaluate the gait, the when we're having when we're looking for a thoracic limb lameness, we want the dog walking towards us, and we're looking for that quote unquote down on the sound. So that's the dog putting more weight on the good leg, trying to offload the bad leg. If there's bilateral issues, then we we're going to see that a little bit more once looking from the side, and it's going to look a little bit more like short strided. So here's an example watching the dog walk towards us. Um, so this is pretty good, walking on a nice loose leash, no distractions outside. You may have noticed that there is a right thoracic limb lameness. So that was a, that 
that was a pretty good video, but um, I think most people would agree that this is even better. So just doing a slow motion video, you can see down on the sound. So the head goes down when the left thoracic limb is planted. That's because her right front leg hurts. Actually, both of her front legs hurt, but her right front leg hurt her more. So she's trying to get her weight off of it as quickly as possible. So weight goes down on the sound leg. All right, it's still even better yet. So we brought her, this is all in the same day, brought Carly back into a treatment area and we can watch her walk around on her own. In this case, you can see she's pretty uncomfortable on both legs. She's just kind of that short, short strided gait. She's also lame on her back right leg too. You might notice that, but she walks and then when she stops, she kind of offloads that right front leg. And then last but not least, this is a home video. And this was what she came in for. It's down there. So this is what she came in for. Stiffness when getting up. So really obvious there, right? So you can see how she stutters and how uncomfortable that looks. So this is this is quite helpful to have this video provided by the by the client. The other nice thing about home videos is that it, it gives you a baseline and then if you're going to institute any sort of treatment, you can be able to look back and see where you came from. I'm not going to get not talking too much about cats, but cats is absolutely like so important to get home videos um, because they just don't walk around the camera, right? You're like, you're not going to do a gait evaluation with a cat. So being able to see home videos for cats are really, really nice. All right, the pelvic limb analysis, the same idea, the dog's trying to offload the hurting leg as quick, quickly as possible, but why, what we call it is a, a hip hike. So the, the leg that is less affected, um, they're going to put more weight on. And so they're trying to take their weight off of the hurting leg. So let's say the dog's walking away from us, the right pelvic limb is sore, it's lame. They're going to shift their weight to the left pelvic limb. That right hip tends to look like it's, it's going more dorsal. Uh, more often with pelvic limb, but we're going to want, want to distinguish between ataxia and lameness. So this is um, this is dog presented. She does actually have bilateral hip dysplasia, but you can see with the left pelvic limb, um, it's pretty short strided, and that left hip went up. Okay, and then also watching from the side, this is a dog with a cruciate injury. Um, trying to minimize the amount of time spent on that, that leg, the leg that hurts. And then lastly, the value of, of slow motion, certainly here, you can kind of see a skip there, but we watch, um, this is Romeo, you see a little kind of skip there. That's just more of kind of a transition between gates, but then at, hold his leg, held his leg up through one transition, hold it up again, so for the sake of time, I'm not going to show you all of his slow motion video, but you are, it is much easier to see his patella luxation skipping gait with a slow-mo video. All right, moving on to the palpation part. So this is this is now the kind of the, the classic part of an orthopedic exam where we're really starting to try and put our hands on there and, and, and sense something with our fingertips. When it comes to joints, what we're trying to do is we're trying to feel for heat. So heat is an indication of inflammation. So you may feel some heat in a joint. More often, we're gonna be trying to feel for effusion. And again, effusion is gonna be more easily felt with dogs standing. Wanting to feel range of motion. And so with range of motion, we're, we're looking for reduced range of motion. Um, and may, usually there's crepitus or often there's crepitus that goes along with that. Or there's just reluctance to let you fully engage fully go through that range of, motion, range of motion due to pain. And then we will have some special tests where we're identifying either hypermobility or hypomobility. Hypo with an O, that is basically a reduced range of motion. Hypermobility means there's laxity in the joint. And so the most obvious um, example is going to be a cruciate tear, a complete cruciate tear. Then moving on to bones, we are wanting to palpate 
all along the length of the bone whenever we can. And then of course, there's gonna be times where you wanna pay particular attention to certain areas that may be over, that, that may be of, of extra concern. For example, a thoracic limb lameness in an eight-year-old Rottweiler. You're gonna to wanna to for sure make sure you're palpating the distal radius and the proximal humerus. Of course, the most, most common areas for osteosarcoma. Dog has a history of a stifle surgery. You're gonna to wanna to palpate over that implant on the proximal medial aspect of the tibia. Um, and then, you know, palpating for instability. If, if there's a fracture, then, you know, that's not always, but often pretty obvious. And you're, you're generally gonna move straight to diagnostic imaging there. Um, so moving from distal to proximal, usually palpating along the length of the, the bones and then getting to the joints, feeling for heat, effusion, range of motion, and mobility. Then there's the soft tissues, and this is the part that isn't, or at least not historically, isn't taught in great detail in vet school um, or to, to, to most people. Um, this is, for me, what I learned in going through rehab training, and, and this is where human physical therapists are very, very, very attuned and very trained at feeling very subtle changes in the soft tissues, such as muscle spasms and trigger points and pain. And there are courses you can go through. You can go through rehab courses. You can go through trigger point courses on learning some of these palpation skills. But there's some basic ones that I mentioned, like the paraspinal palpation, and then some other um, areas of soft tissue that are, are kind of fairly common areas that, that will be a source of lameness. For example, the biceps tendon in the shoulder. Dogs that have elbow dysplasia, elbow arthritis, they are at a greater risk of having a shoulder tendinopathy as well, although we often see shoulder tendinopathies unrelated to the elbow. Knowing when it comes to soft tissues that the injuries are most likely to occur at the musculotendinous junction, then if you go back and review anatomy and understand where that musculotendinous junction is, first of all, and then what muscle you're dealing with, um, that can help you narrow down what the problem is. And then again, ligaments, um, cruciates is the most obvious one, but we'll also have our medial and lateral collateral ligaments and some other less obvious ligaments, um, especially when we get to the distal limbs, but not forgetting to palpate for, for those tissues as well. And then lastly, fascia, skin, scar tissue, not gonna get into those details here, but knowing that these are areas that can be sources of pain. Um, and if you're interested in going through more advanced learning, I would I encourage you to go through some rehab training because this is, is some of the things that are taught there. Just want to kind of end with a few of the special tests that can ideally be worked into a, your comprehensive orthopedic exam. So starting with cruciate, palpation of cruciate disease. Cruciate disease is going to be the most common uh, pelvic limb lameness that we're seeing. And the very first two signs that you will feel um, or you, you'll see and feel are effusion in the joint and pain with hyperextension of the knee or pain with just putting in the, the stifle into extension. The reason for that is one of the jobs of the cranial cruciate ligament is to, is to prevent stifle, overextension of the stifle. So if there's a, it doesn't even have to be partially torn, there can just be a sprain of the cruciate ligament. So it can be early disease of that cruciate. And you put the stifle into full extension, the dog may pull back. Um, they may indicate that's uncomfortable for me. That is a protective mechanism. It's the body saying, ah, my ligament here is not at full strength. Please don't go any further there. So if you can't do any other stifle palpation, just palpate for hyperextension. It's very uncommon to have a dog with a cruciate injury that doesn't have that that is comfortable with full stifle extension. So if I see a dog that was sent to me for suspected cruciate injury and they allow me to do that full stifle extension and they don't react to it at, at all, it's it, it, it makes me question what the diagnosis is. Of course, we're gonna move on and do some other tests, but many times you won't have positive door or, or positive thrust but you'll still have this pain on extension with a cruciate rupture or cru cruciate injury, I should say. Um, so then other things we're gonna feel for medial buttress, pelvic limb atrophy. So I mentioned that that has been shown to be a sensitive indicator for cruciate disease. Cranial tibial thrust, let's go through how to do that. 
So cranial drawer, <clears throat> you do need the dog to be fairly relaxed and cooperative. <clears throat> and it is ideal. <clears throat> it is certainly ideal <clears throat> to palpate, excuse me, <clears throat> to palpate with a dog in lateral recumbency. It's easier to feel. But you can feel it with a dog standing, especially if they're not wanting to put much weight on that leg, um, especially if they're non-weight bearing, you can you can pretty easily manipulate to do a cranial drawer exam with that standing position. So the keys here are proper positioning of your of your fingers. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all of these details here because I do have an exam or a video that goes through these details. But what I want to point out is where people often have problems. And that is rather than having cranial caudal positioning of your fingers, they're more medial lateral. The other thing is squeezing too hard. So if you squeeze too hard as you try and try and push and manipulate, the dog's going to react painfully, and that can be a, a false positive, or they'll just kind of tense up and, and you're not able to do that manipulation. So you don't have to squeeze hard. You, it and it's often it's often not a highly uh, uncomfortable test for them, especially if it's a complete tear, ironically. If the dog is too stressed, if they're too anxious, if they're fearful, they're going to tense up their muscles and it's going to be hard to feel for this. I mean, this happens to everyone. Um, this is where you can, again, try, the, try it with the dog standing, or you may need to, to use, you know, more sedation in order to, to palpate for that cranial drawer. But it's a pretty, if you can put your hands on the dog, you're it, there's really, really high likelihood you can be able to test for that hyperextension. Tibial thrust. So I know that um, when I talked about some people will have a um, hard time with tibial thrust and easier time with cranial drawer, and sometimes it's vice versa. It, they they complement one another, um, right? So it is ideal to be able to do both of the tests. If you had to just pick one, I mean, tibial thrust is a little bit more mimicking what we're um, what happens when the cruciate is torn, and it's certainly what we're trying to um, correct for when we do any of, of the surgical correction. So ideally, being able to palpate for tibial thrust is, is great. Um, and again, with the dog in lateral recumbency is easier, but you can do it with them standing. Um, the biggest, my biggest recommendation here, what I see people do incorrectly, is when you are pushing with your, your finger here to flex the tarsus, you do not want to be bending the stifle. So you need to keep that stifle in a neutral position and not bend it in order to allow that tibia to thrust your finger forward if it's going to. So let me show you a couple um, videos. So this dog, of course, is in surgery, getting ready to, to go to surgery, and it does have a complete cruciate tear. So it's the dog's asleep, and it's a very obvious one, but um, just showing that the positioning, so patella, fabella, tibial tuberosity, and fibular head, that's the positioning of the fingers. Now for a tibial thrust, you wanna test with the dog's uh, um, limb in neutral and with internal rotation of the tibia. And so you're running your finger down along the patellar tendon to end right on that tibial tuberosity, and that's with internal rotation. This is neutral. So internally rotating that tibia um, can make it become more dramatic um, because, again, one of the jobs of the cruciate is to prevent internal rotation. Patella luxation. So this, um, most people are usually pretty confident with this, but the, the trick here is making sure that the stifle is in, not fully extended, but more closely to extension than, than flexion usually and then internally or externally rotating the tibia as you nudge that, that patella with your thumb. Um, okay, yeah, for the sake, if anybody has specific questions about patella, I'll come back to it, but for sake of time, just, just keep going here. Um, so I do wanna talk about Ortolani because this is one that I think, I, I found that people don't feel comfortable with. And so Ortolani is testing for hip laxity. And if, if the dog has hip laxity, if they have a positive Ortolani, they have hip dysplasia. And it means they are likely to develop arthritis. It doesn't ever mean that they're going to be clinically affected. You've got to, you know, there, there's, it's ideal to do more imaging at this point, but 
it is a great screening tool to do an Ortolani exam for at-risk dogs um, young. So you can do this as early as 16 weeks of age. My Labrador, I did when he was 16 weeks of age. I brought him in, gave him exactly, um, actually I just start with Torb um, and many cases you can just get away with 0.2 mix per kg of Torb. Um, this is one where you do want them on a table, but you're gonna pre-medicate them first to make sure that they're comfortable. Tips here, you want to stabilize the sacrum, not the hip. So this proximal hand, my pinky is all the way down on the table, stabilizing the, the sacrum, not over the hip joint. So if your hand is too far lateral over the hip, you're not gonna be able to stabilize that pelvis very well. The next one is your, your distal hand is around the stifle, and you're going to be pushing that femur towards your top hand. So you're gonna be applying a, a proximal force here. Then you're going to adduct the, the limb to kind of bring the, the stifle towards the table to start as you're maintaining that proximal force. And then you're going to abduct. And what you're looking for or feeling for is a clunk right over the hip. So here's the, here's the actual video. So I'm pushing in and then as I abduct, watching and feeling for a clunk. And so you're gonna see it on this next one. Hopefully you saw that kind of clunking in there. And that is the hip, the femoral head was subluxated outside of the acetabulum. As you bring it up, it kind of clunks back in. That's a positive ortolan. So you wanna palpate for this again in young dogs as early as 16 weeks of age. Once they become mature, uh, I don't have a great age here because this dog was actually about two and a half, which was surprising for this to, to find a positive ortolani. But once they have really significant changes to that joint, meaning they have a lot of proliferation osteophytes that develop around the joint, you don't get that nice clunk anymore. Um, it, it, in fact, you may not get any sort of ortolani. So it is an exam that is best performed in that first year of life and as early as possible to identify dogs that are, um, have hip dysplasia. Bicep stretch test. So the biceps muscle <clears throat> is a fairly common cause of thoracic limb lameness. And it is often associated with dogs that have elbow dysplasia, elbow arthritis, because the biceps muscle originates on the, the scapula, crosses the shoulder joint, and then it inserts on the radius and ulna. So it crosses two joints, which immediately puts it at risk for being injured. So the way that we test for discomfort or pain is by stretching it. So putting it opposite of its full action, which is to flex the shoulder and extend the elbow as shown here. And then you may need to come and put some additional palpation or pressure over the origin of the biceps tendon up at the shoulder. Dogs that have very severe biceps tendinopathy, you don't even have to apply this pressure. You try and put them in that stretch and they don't like it. They immediately pull back. Those with a little bit more mild, if you apply your pressure, your pressure here with palpation, the, what you're looking for them is to do is, is pull back. Um, and if you find that, then that suggests that they may have a shoulder tendinopathy. All right, as I mentioned, there's a, um, a link for the full orthopedic exam. And this one is, a, it takes me about 20 minutes to do the demonstration. In real life, depending on the dog, I can do a, a, a comprehensive exam much quicker, you know, a few minutes, again, very much depending on the dog. So I allow for about 20 minutes or so to do this exam, um, making sure that the dog is comfortable throughout it. So hopefully Christy will share this link for you guys and you can, can watch it um, on your free time. All right, so after you've done your exam, the next step is gonna be diagnostic imaging. We're not gonna get into that, but radiographs are always gonna be the place to start, even though many times we've done. Sometimes we may need to end up with more advanced imaging, but high quality, well-positioned radiographs, orthogonal views, use uh, stress-free handling and sedation to get these. To wrap up, all right, the five um, keys to take away from here. So observation, just getting used to seeing how dogs normally move and their normal postures and positions. And then it will help you pick up of what's what's abnormal. And again, it's not going to tell you all the time. Well, it's maybe sometimes going to guide you to exactly what's wrong, but it really starts giving you clues that you start to put together. 
um, as you build, um, you know, build, build your case for further diagnostics or for a complete diagnosis. Use home videos. So ask your clients to send you videos. Um, just really can't emphasize that enough. When you're doing any sort of palpation, you're looking for that earliest sign of avoidance or discomfort. Um, and it, it often looks like signs of fear, um, sorry, signs of, of stress and anxiety, but you wanna look for the most early signs. So it might be just dilation of the pupils or holding the breath. If you find that, that's a, a good clue that you're getting to an area that they don't like you to touch. You've got to make friends with the dog first and you've got to earn their trust in order for them to, to really relax. And I promise you're going to feel so much more and you're going to find those subtle signs so much easier um, if, if you're able to start with a relaxed dog. And that includes not starting with a TPR. Um, that's not getting off on the right foot. Um, again, better exams through chemistry for sure. Use the drugs. Um, you know, it, it, it just helps everyone involved. Uh, incorporate that one minute screen. So the more that you do this, the more you incorporate it into any exam that you're doing, the more you'll, under, you'll start to recognize what's normal, what's not, uh, what's abnormal. And then lastly, and, and possibly most importantly, is don't sacrifice these fear-free principles just for the sake of being complete and thorough. Um, that is what I was trained to do. And that's what I did in my early career. And I have all sorts of regret to this day. Um, for, for putting dogs in stressful positions and, and, and causing anxiety when um, all I needed was just a little bit more patience. So with that, um, I'm happy. Well, so the first thing I'll point out is, um, you know, again, I, I am an employee of Zoetis and thank you to Zoetis for um, uh, sponsoring this presentation. And we've got all sorts of, of cool resources for you, including videos for CAT orthopedic exams um, by the one and only uh, Duncan Dr. Duncan Lascelles, um, that you can find linked through this website, um, the New Science of Pain OA. And yeah, so with that, Christy, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, um, Dr. Shaw. That was fantastic. And we have tons of questions. And I'll give you one guess what many of them are asking about. The dose of trazodone and gabapentin? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we predicted this before it even started, that that was gonna be our yeah. number. But yeah, so uh, my my dose of, of trazodone is usually three to five mg per kg and gabapentin. It, it depends whether the dog's already on it or if they're fresh. So, if, um, but to be honest, it's I, I tend to go high on gabapentin when I'm going for any sort of sedation. Um, but also, you know, if it's a so if it's a more anxious and more fearful dog, I'm going to go closer to the 30 mg per kg. If it's a geriatric dog or they've never seen gabapentin in their life, might go closer to the five mg per kg. But for me, I'm usually at least 10 mg per kg of gabapentin um, in these scenarios. So 300 to 600 milligrams for most dogs. Would you say, and um, this is a question that we got a few variations on, that um, some people have noticed that trazodone either wasn't enough or didn't, or, or actually made the dog more reactive to certain things. Mm -hmm. Is combining it with GABA going okay. to make that all work more smoothly? Is that the, I, your, I, your favorite recipe? I, yes, I do think that they are um, synergistic. So I think that absolutely there's cases where trazodone alone isn't enough or you have to go higher on the dose. But I find when you combine it with that gabapentin, it's, it's really nice. Um, the other one that we started using more of, and this is gonna be, this could open up a whole can of worms of conversation, and it will depend on where you live, but um, CBD. And we use Elevet um, Common Comfort. So it's a, just a higher dose of CBD and that, that can be helpful as well um, in that, that cocktail. Now, there's gonna be some dogs that that's not enough. And once they get to the hospital, especially if they're aggressive, um, uh, you know, and I would say that, sorry, aggressive is the wrong word. If they're incredibly fearful mm -hmm. and that fear comes out as aggression, we are going to reach for dexmedetomidine usually as the next step, or sometimes you butorphanol. Of course, it's gonna depend on, uh, on the individual patient, but, 
think the gabapentin combination is a great place to start. And I'm glad you brought up CBD because we had some questions about that okay. as well. So you're really just hitting on all the bases. Here. <laughs> um, this was a question. This is this is what we in journalism call a loaded question, but we're going to go with it. Um, <laughs> how do you address the issue of ongoing slash increased fearfulness or nervousness due to using food luring to perform exams and treatments? Yeah, um, I think I think there's a, a a lot of education that needs to go on in terms of educating the profession on on luring itself and what that means because I think most people don't know that you can that if you just lure an animal it's going to make them more and more and more anxious mm -hmm. and honestly I didn't recognize that until going through this course until working with a vet who um, really had a very strong behavior background. Um, so I think it's it's a matter of really continuing these discussions and continuing the, the fear-free discussion and, and teaching our colleagues that luring is bad um, and how to how to how to do it appropriately. So you know, giving the treats, um, not just like teasing them along the way. So I don't know if I answered the question, but I I I appreciate the question. I think it's a good one. No, it. I mean, I think that a lot of pet owners also don't understand the difference. It's part yeah. of why they don't like what they perceive as so-called positive training because they mm -hmm. they misunderstand the psychological mechanism that you're going for. And mm -hmm. so I, I am neither a veterinarian nor a trainer, mm -hmm. but as a dog owner, learning the difference to me was really just a moment of, that was my big aha moment in, yeah. you know, acclimating dogs to things or training mm -hmm. them. Oh, that's great. So we're going to shift gears now to money, um, the mm -hmm. second favorite topic after drugs <laughs> in our profession. Um, how do you charge for these visits the same as a regular exam or? Mm -hmm. um, so I will say, you know, I know that my situation is a, a little bit more unique, um, but we would charge for the original consultation, which includes the the full you know the initial exam it includes a lot of discussion and a lot of talking to the client so for me again it was an hour and a half but an hour an hour of that is spent talking to the client and it's gathering the history and it's it's the educational piece to the client on the back end of it um, but if we need them to to come back and drop off for an orthopedic workup usually at that point I don't charge for another exam we would just charge um, for outpatient hospitalization, which in our practice is about $50. Um, and that would include oral sedation, we, which we would usually send home with them. Great. Um, have you noticed any correlation between hiccuping and pain being, you know, do dogs hiccup from being yeah. in pain? I have never I noticed that. Has observed this. Huh. Yeah. I have not. I have not seen many dogs hiccup. <clears throat> I remember when when my dog was young and he hiccuped a lot. I thought it was so cute because I just rarely saw a dog hiccup. That's a great observation. I would think that if the dog comes in and they're totally normal and hiccuping is not normal for them, and then they start hiccuping during the exam, I don't know. My 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 gut would tell me that it's more a anxiety issue, mm -hmm. but that could it, it could be that they're anxious that the you're getting somewhere near a place that's painful for them. Just answering someone's non-veterinary question here. <laughs> there we go. Done. Um, <laughs> so how do you uh, grade your patellar luxations? Okay, yeah, let me go back to that. So uh, patellar luxations are generally graded um, one to four. This is one of the few areas that was pretty consistent one to four. Um, I say that compared to like a lameness evaluation where people make up their own scoring system. So grade one to me means that the patella is riding in the groove. When I manually luxate it, it will pop out. But as soon as I you know, put the limb through range of motion, it's going to come right back in. 
a grade two is where it's writing in the groove most of the time. I can manually subluxate or, or, or luxate it, sorry. Um, and it will stay out for a period of time, maybe a few, few um, you know, flexion extension cycles, but then it's going to pop back in and prefer to stay in the groove. A grade three is where it's writing outside of the groove, but you can still manually replace it by kind of nudging it back in. And a grade four is where it's out and it's stuck out. And those grade fours are often associated with much more significant limb deformity um, that the grade one, two, and three are often, you know, especially a two to a three can be a progression from a, from a two to a three. A grade four, a lot of times those are dogs are born with a pretty severe angular limb deformity. Hopefully that answers the question. I can't imagine you doing it any better. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you go high on pre-visit meds, do you run the risk of blurring symptoms? Yeah, um, uh, of course, yes, and that is the risk. So this is where trying to balance the patient's history and their need for the meds. So if it's a dog that um, if you're looking for something very, very subtle, then it becomes much, much trickier. Um, but if you can combine home videos and looking for things ahead of time, and then, um, then looking for some of those more subtle changes, the, the short answer is yes, you do run that risk. But this is the balance between being able to maintain a long-term relationship with this patient um, and potentially build on your exam over subsequent visits or getting everything you want at one visit. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's always a balance, but the short answer is yes. And trying to figure out what that sweet spot is. Plus there's a risk in the other direction too. So yeah. 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 Great. Okay. Um, we have eight more questions. We're not going to be able to get to them all. It is already 12 minutes past the hour. Are you okay to go for a couple more? Oh, I'm great. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, one veterinarian says that a current question she asks clients when asking about their pet's mobility is how the pet handles stairs, such as runs up them or how they go down the stairs. Is this a good question? Great question. Yeah, absolutely great question. Because it can go even further you know, do they sit at the bottom of the stairs and look up and think, oh, all right, I've got to do this, um, or at the top of the stairs? Because I have actually the black lab that I showed you, the video, the um, gait evaluation video, she would not do stairs. She was incredibly reluctant to do stairs. And she was actually part of a clinical study we were doing for a medication that's not available yet. Um, but when she was treated with this medication, she that was the main feedback that the client gave us that she would she was happy to do stairs and so yeah i've observed it with my own dogs so looking for stairs is, is a great one that's a really good one to look for uh, with cats too great and this is our last question i'm really sorry to everyone that we didn't get to your questions um fourth year vet student here how do you balance the needs of the patient with the wants of the owner some owners get angry if you ask them to come back again as they prefer to have everything done in one visit. Yeah. Um, yes, it's a, it's a great question. And I can imagine, especially out of vet school, you're seeing clients that sometimes aren't local. They've come a long way and they've waited a long time to get an appointment and everything that goes into a vet school visit. I think it, it really comes down to the education of the client and getting them to understand that you're, you always have the patient's best interest at heart. And that if their if their dog and, and I've been in this situation because I would have clients come from different areas and we would just have to explain that our philosophy and and actually once I became fear free certified it made it so much easier to say I practice by fear free principles and I'm a fear free fear free certified and so my philosophy is that I'm not going to put a patient um, or your dog through something that I think is going to be causing them undue stress and anxiety when we have options to, to mitigate that. What my advice would be is to be as much as possible, if possible, um, 
giving clients that information ahead of time. So what we would do is, you know, on our website, I should also preface that I, I actually am not in practice anymore. I feel like I still am because it was not very long ago, but in, in the practice I used to be at, we would tell these clients ahead of time um, what to expect. And it, that included what the exam would be like and our philosophy to, that we, we use stress-free handling and fear-free principles so that they, they knew as much as possible coming into it that uh, that would be a possibility that, that we're only gonna do what's best for the animal at that point in time. Yeah, I, I would echo that preparing them in advance is the best way that, that mm -hmm. this is a process. Um, yeah. We've observed that as well with in Fear Free with um, clients who don't really know what Fear Free is. They're not there mm -hmm. specifically because of Fear Free. But as long as you tell them up front, they accept things better. Yeah. Um, I like your word of process. I think it is It is a process mm -hmm. for many yeah. dogs. Yeah, it is. I, I have greyhounds, so you know that getting <laughs> an orthopedic exam on a terrified, great, shaking, <laughs> yeah. drooling greyhound is not exactly, um, it's an education, let's just say, for everyone yeah. involved. <laughs> so everyone, I'm so sorry that's all we have time for. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Shaw. And thanks again to all of you for being here, for your great questions, and to Zoetis Pet Care for making this presentation possible. For those of you attending tonight, we'll be sending out the CE email on Friday, tomorrow. That is for race CE for veterinary professionals. For those of you who are asking or interested in fear-free CE, you will be entering that manually in your CE tracker. So just log in, go to your CE tracker, and you just enter in an hour for this webinar. Um, if you do not receive your race email, your race CE certificate in email, and that will be the email you use to register for this webinar, um, email the office at wags at fearfreepets.com and they will assist you with that. Um, we hope to see you for our next Fear Free webinar. They're never too old. Senior patient anesthesia and paraoperative management with Dr. Ralph Harvey. That's gonna be Wednesday of next week, May 26th at 8 p.m. Eastern again. You can register at fearfreepets.com slash webinars. <laughs> if you haven't already received an email or seen one of our many social posts about it, um, that's where you can